On a typical dreary Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, I dragged myself into the laundromat. Being in a laundry on a Sunday morning makes you feel gloomy, regardless of the weather outside, although I had no clue if it was gray outdoors. The usage of a laundromat was something I had only begun doing a year ago. Our laundry room is in the basement, so my wife had been doing it there before then. The laundry room was in my previous residence until I moved out almost a year and a half ago, when my wife officially became my ex-wife. My new Sunday ritual now included a trip to the laundromat, which is located around one mile away from my flat. I made sure to get to the laundromat and back home early because I hate doing laundry and didn't want this chore to ruin my weekend. I saved myself the trouble of maybe having to strike up a polite conversation with other customers while waiting for a machine on a busy day. Surely, Sundays were meant for slouching on a hangover and perusing the paper in peace and quiet. This time was different, though. I'd seen her at the laundromat about nine months ago, but I'd never paid her any mind until now. The wagon she was pulling appeared to have a slightly bent wheel, which was making it spin erratically. Wheeling it in behind her while attempting to keep the door pulled open with her other hand was a challenge because it was loaded with dirty garments. In keeping with my nature as a generally decent guy, I set down my sports section as soon as I noticed this and proceeded to the door, where I held it formally for her as she pushed the wagon inside. With her large brown eyes and pearly whites, she shot me a smile that would light up the world. With a thank you, mister. She made her way to a line of washers against the far wall of the laundromat. Her mop of long, wavy brown hair gave her away as being about seven or eight years old, and her race was probably mixed or Hispanic. She was too cute for words. When I looked behind, I thought I saw a parent following closely, but I didn't. Now I was really unsettled and fascinated. Instead of sorting her laundry by color, as I had been instructed to do, I watched as the little girl tossed her whole stack into the washing machine. After loading the machine with detergent from the wagon, she added her money and hit the start button. She retrieved a small plush animal from the cart, sat down in a chair, and began to converse softly with the animal as the washing machine ran. Her denim, long sleeve shirt, and pink jacket were clearly out of date, especially considering the 20 degree morning temperature. As I sat nearly across from the laundromat, although they weren't filthy, the years of use had made them look worn and weathered. There was an air of composure about her that didn't belong. Even though she appeared to be just above a street urchin, I also find it hard to imagine that a parent would entrust such a little girl with the responsibility of washing the family's laundry all by herself. Something wasn't right about this entire situation, as I am a parent myself. That led me full round to my own agreement. I imagine that right now, my kids are sound asleep in their cozy beds at my previous residence. In about an hour or two, when they eventually open their eyes, my ex-wife, who is their mother, will likely be preparing a hearty meal of pancakes, eggs, and bacon. Haley, my 15-year-old daughter, has a preference for pancakes, while my 13-year-old son, Ethan, is a major bacon enthusiast. Waffles were my favorite but I long for the days of joyful family breakfasts spent together. As one would expect after a divorce, my wife was granted custody of the children. Although I was granted visiting rights, my nasty wife went to go lengths to turn the children against me, accusing me of destroying our family due to my selfishness. During our brief encounters, my children made it clear that they were uninterested in spending time with me. On a long weekend break with three other couples, and the man she ended up having sex with, a wealthy man who made it a habit to have sex with other men's wives. My wife cuckolded me because I refused to sit still. They planned to sleep together, and then she would come back to me and continue to be as faithful as she was before the weekend. She said it wasn't cheating since she told me in advance, but she was planning to steal my money, possessions, and house in the event that I caused a stir. She also wanted to harm my connection with my children as a means of exacting revenge, which she would receive. She accomplished all she had promised me when I refused, and naturally, she blamed me. Without a doubt, 
the children believed it. I was screwed. My stomach growled at the memory of those family meals. And I realized that it had been quite some time since I had anything to eat other than the Mickey's malt and brats that I had while watching the Knicks game at the pub. On one wall, there was a Coke machine and an awful replica of a vending machine. I would have thought the laundry owner took out the money from both machines daily. Otherwise, they would have been destroyed long ago. A case of me and a Coke Zero were my purchases. As I reached for the soda can, my eyes shifted to the girl playing nearby. I thought she was stealthily observing me, but then I noticed that it was actually my snacks that she was keeping an eye on. I am the parent of someone, and it broke my heart to see the expression on her face as she watched my nibbles. I approached her from behind and softly asked if she wanted my Diet Coke and Mems. She sat up straight in her chair, her face turning sorrowful as she declined my offer, after which she brightened up significantly. Mommy says I'm not supposed to take food from strangers, especially from men, she told us. That's a very good rule, sweetheart. And you should always listen to what your mommy says, he said. Tell you what, I'll just put the soda and the moms on the chair next to you, and you can take them if you want. I'll get myself more and go back to my seat. After setting the food down, I returned to the vending machines and grabbed another bag of MMs and Diet Coke. In order to keep an eye on her from above, I returned to my seat and took out my newspaper. After waiting around for approximately five minutes, she proceeded to grab the drink and MEMS. Inwardly, I grinned. After folding both of my loads and loading them into my car, I departed approximately 90 minutes later. As I walked away, preoccupied with my own life and plans for the remainder of Sunday, I failed to give the child further consideration until I returned to the laundromat the following Sunday, about 7 a.m. Ah, uh, I must admit that the child remained completely out of my mind. Following that, I pondered whether she would reappear. After what seemed like an eternity, she reappeared at the entrance, this time dragging the heavily laden wagon of garments. After she thanked me and proceeded to the far wall's machines, I kept the door open for her again. She wore the identical outfit from last week, as far as I could tell. After patiently waiting for her to begin loading, I sat down next to her and cautiously approached. I see you've got a problem with a back wheel on your wagon, sweetie. Would it be okay if I tried to fix it? While tinkering with her bear, she gave a confirmation sign by nodding. I noticed that the rear right wheel had become deformed on its axle when I flipped the wagon over. After straightening things up with my hands, I rolled the wagon in both directions to make sure I was on the right track. I can fix the wagon in no time. It was as if my small pal had been transfixed. While reaching out for a handshake, I mentioned that my name is Alex Rogers. Maddie Ruiz. Very glad to meet you, sir. She extended her small hand with all the grace she could summon. Well, now that we've introduced ourselves, we're not strangers anymore. I commented. What would you say to a soda and some candy? She said with wide eyes. Could I possibly have a real Coke this week? Sure thing. One real Coke for you, a diet for me, and some mems for both of us. Almost two hours passed as we conversed. She was introduced to Tick, Tay by me, who retrieved a notebook and pen from my car. After an initial five-minute learning curve, she was soon up to speed. Like I used to do with my own kids, I gave her a chance to win on occasion. For a brief moment, I daydreamed about engaging in imaginative play with my children. On the night my life as I knew it came to an end, I dozed off to a vision of my then. Wife Tracy, staring me down as she informed me that she was going to have an affair with Robert Goldstein, i.e. a lawyer from the big city. It's just this one night. Alex. It won't mean anything. It will just be sex. What? Are you kidding me? This isn't going to be just sex. It's going to be the end of our marriage. I replied. Alex, stop being that way. She exclaimed angrily. Don't throw away 18 years of marriage over one night. 
I didn't sneak behind your back like I could have. We could have done this, and you would probably never have known. Just give me this, Alex. Robert led Tracy to his bedroom in the four-room home, where they slipped his hand into his. It felt like hours, but was probably just a minute. Yet I stood there with my mouth open before collecting my belongings and leaving. Alex, it's your turn, Maddie murmured, snapping me back to the here and now at that moment. Maddie had an opportunity to win by getting three O's in a row diagonally after I marked a X in one of the side boxes. She strung her three instruments together and put on her most triumphant look for me to see. I shouted, High five, kid! while extending my hand far beyond her reach. After giving me a sidelong glance, she got up from her chair and extended her hand to finish the high five. She exclaimed, Gotcha! while speaking. Until Maddie's laundry was finished and folded, I remained in the laundromat. I was going to offer to drive her home, but she said no because it went against Mom's rules. Mom's a smart woman. I'd like to meet her sometime. I informed her. Well, perhaps one day. She's not very outgoing, Maddie responded. As winter transitioned into spring and spring into summer, I persisted in maintaining this regimen with Maddie. I established a routine of buying drink at the laundromat and bringing a little baggie with snacks and a sandwich for the two of us. Although I wasn't very hungry at that hour, I reasoned that she was ridiculously tiny and that if I had a sandwich, she would have one too. I then suggested that she bring the extra sandwich home to share with her mom, so I began to pack an extra one. Instead of complaining, she consistently praised me. At this point, she had informed me that she was seven years old and would be starting second grade at the local primary school this coming September. Maddie had informed me that she had never met her father, and there was also no father figure in the household. Maddie didn't know her mother's exact occupation when she was in school, but she was always home when she returned from school, so it's safe to assume that she had some kind of part-time job. Though they would sometimes venture out to the park on nice days, she and her mother spent most of their time inside their apartment. Their main source of entertainment was television, and Maddie had seen nearly every animated film that had aired on children's networks recently. Even the first one eluded me. Despite the lack of spending money, Maddie's mother would sometimes take her out on Saturday night outings, telling her to get herself to bed by 9 o'clock. Every Sunday morning, her mother would rouse her from her slumber, hand her the money for a washing machine and dryer, and then send her off to the laundromat in her wagon. I had enough money to live, but to be honest, my life wasn't much better than Maddie's at this time. My revenue as a lead computer programmer was severely limited, leaving little room for frills like going out to a bar once in a while with some friends. After paying child support, alimony, and mortgage, I never went on a date. That seemed obvious to me, but I was homesick for my kids. I was fine with that, until I remembered how they handled me following our breakup with Tracy. Even though I tried to dwell on the good times I'd had with them, the harsh truth always managed to sneak up on me. Tracy yelled out, Where the hell are you? As soon as I answered the phone in my house, the morning following my departure from Robert Goldstein's Lake property, it appeared to be 10. 6. On my phone. At 2. 13. I poured myself another shot of Eagle Rare Bourbon, the last thing on my mind. At some point, I must have hobbled into bed and dozed out. You've abandoned me at the lake house. How am I to return home? She screamed at me once again. Get out. Let Robert Goldstein, I, I take you home. She was shouting something else as I ended the call. You can't use a cell phone to abruptly end a call the way you can with a landline man. My old self would have slammed the phone so hard that it shattered it off the wall. On the subsequent Sunday, Maddie was approximately 15 minutes tardier than normal and did not have her laundry wagon with her. I assumed maybe she had been robbed because tears were streaking down her young cheeks. With her bear slung beneath her right arm, she carried it about. She stated, Mommy didn't come home last night and I don't have any money for the laundry machines as I approached her. 
asking as softly as possible, does she not come home sometimes? Her large brown eyes betrayed her emotions as she firmly rejected the idea. Mommy always comes home. That's another one of her rules. I managed to calm her down and provided her with the food that I had brought along. I felt lost and confused because I had never been here before. Is there someone you can stay with until your mommy comes home? I inquired. While chewing on her peanut butter and jelly sandwich, she firmly rejected the idea once more. I couldn't bear to leave her in her apartment alone, but I also knew that if I contacted the police without a strategy, they would place her in a foster home the next day and may permanently remove her from her mother if they didn't believe she was providing enough care for the child, something I already had my reservations about. How about we go to your apartment and leave your mommy a note telling her we're at my apartment? She can call me when she gets home and I will bring you back to her. On this one, I could practically feel her gears turning. Even though it was against her mother's regulations, I doubt she wanted to spend the day in her apartment by herself since her mother wasn't coming home. At last, she gave a confirmation nod. First, we went to her place after I folded and put my belongings in my car. There was nothing of value to collect at Maddie's place, so that's why we didn't bother. Either she was wearing what few clothes she had, or they were among the piles of dirty laundry at the laundromat. I informed her that we would make a pit break where I would get a few items, such as a fresh hairbrush and toothbrush, for her. A sorrowful grin escaped her lips as she offered it to me. Before we went to get Maddie some stuff, I put a note in the center of the little kitchen table that had my name and phone number on it. I took her to a Dollar General close by so she could choose out some clothes, including jeans, blouses, underwear, and socks. She appeared ecstatic, but I was worrying about what to do in the event that her mother didn't return soon enough. The Disney Channel and animated cartoons were shown. After making lunch and dinner, I tucked her into bed on the sofa in my spare room around 9 o'clock. In order to sort things out, I intended to call in sick the following day and take a personal day from work. On Monday, after waiting until lunch, Maddie and I returned to her apartment. However, there was no indication that anyone had been there since our last visit the day before. While exploring the flat, I rummaged through her mother's chest of drawers and discovered a drawer containing documentation. One of the helpful items I discovered was Maddie's birth certificate. I noted that it was missing a father's name. Fiona Ruiz was the name of her mother. I snatched a picture of Maddie and her mom in addition to her birth certificate. This picture was most likely shot when Maddie was around two years old. She appeared to be little older than a toddler. For the sake of the camera, the two were embracing. Fiona shared Maddie's long, curly brown hair and appeared to be in her mid-twenties. They both smiled for the camera, but Fiona's worn, sad eyes betrayed her obvious beauty. I couldn't help but wonder if that expression has changed or intensified in recent years. As I meticulously sorted through her mother's belongings, Maddie closely observed. I made an effort to strike up a discussion and explain that I was searching for information that would lead us to her mother. It seemed as if she accepted it. I escorted Maddie to her bedroom, dialed 911, and reported Fiona Ruiz missing after returning to my apartment, where I put her down and switched on the Disney Channel. The officer who took the phone didn't hear much from me, beyond my belief that she had to experience something in order to abandon her child. And is the child alone in the apartment now, sir? The officer said, rest assured, she is with me. I am the closest friend the child has. I will be more than happy to keep her by my side till this is handled. If you would be willing to do that until child services contacts you, that would be greatly appreciated. I was worried that Maddie would wind up in foster care no one I knew who had been through the system had anything positive to say about it. I was determined to do what was right by her if I could keep her. As I was thinking about this, a thought came to me. Darlene, my boss's wife, had some powerful friends in the social services field. Perhaps I could drum up some favors for her. Having worked for him for 20 years and done some really fine work for his company, I'd like to think that my employer and I were on pretty good terms. From a personal aspect, 
We always seemed to get along swimmingly, and he and his wife were there for me when I went through my divorce. After our conversation with Darlene's husband, I met up with her at my apartment 20 minutes later. She claimed she was looking to meet new friends, and I introduced her to Maddie. In five minutes, Darlene had Maddie captivated, and I had the same reaction. When Darlene finally left an hour later, I was embraced and promised she would do everything in her power to ensure that Maddie remained with me. I provided two police officers a copy of the photo of Maddie and her mom when they dropped by my apartment later that day. They didn't appear very hopeful about locating Fiona Ruiz. It was a pretty sweet setup. I took Maddie to work with me in the morning, ate lunch with her at noon, and took her home with me at night. Until school started, I went back to work on Tuesday, and we signed her up for our company daycare, which Darlene had helped set up about 15 years ago. I never used it for my kids because Tracy was a stay. At home mom until they could fend for themselves after school, but it was a godsend for me now that I was playing father. Having Maddie by my side made it easier to deal with my own children's abandonment. I saw them only on rare occasions, and even then, it was usually only for lunch at a local joint. On one occasion, I met with my children. I left Maddie with a neighbor named Mrs. Ed. Olivares because they didn't feel the need to demonstrate their feelings toward me. Maddie brought a breath of fresh air into my life. She and her mother didn't do much outside the house because of financial constraints, so most of my outings with her were new experiences. The first time we went to a real restaurant, not a fast food joint, she was enchanted like a space alien. After playing at the playground, we went to the park and stopped for a pretzel and a soda and you would have thought I had taken her to high tea. I think she smiled for a week after that first time, and I smiled for a week after that, just listening to her exclaim over the experience. It seems she was bilingual. She began to teach me Spanish and would laugh so hard at my jumbled words and phrases that she would cry. For some reason, it never occurred to her that most people don't speak two languages. I once ordered a horse and a Coke at a McDonald's, and she laughed so hard that she started to cry. They didn't raise too many questions when I listed myself as her contact person and my apartment as her address. I also kept her in the same school she attended for first grade, as it was the easiest thing to do for the school system. I had her birth certificate. It seems like Darlene must have pulled someone's arm for me or the city just decided they had too many outstanding cases to be concerned about Maddie and me because neither the police nor any social services agency seeking to place Maddie in foster care ever got back to me regarding her mother. Staying with Maddie made me realize that a pizza and a beer wasn't going to cut it anymore. We began to watch cooking shows on the Food Channel and would tag team in the kitchen, something I never did with my own kids. Because Tracy was a fantastic cook, I'll admit, but with Maddie's help, I was learning and improving, and we had incredible fun. I'm not going to lie and say everything was perfect for us. We had our spats and problems like any other family, but that was just it, like any other family. We had been together a little over a year, and Maddie and I had grown into our own version of a family, and it was pointed out to me at Maddie's school at the beginning of third grade. We were at a school open house one evening and were walking in the hallway when one of Maddie's friends and her parents came up to say hello. Maddie's friend introduced her parents as my mom and dad, and then Maddie introduced me as her dad. I hadn't even thought about our family in those terms. And when she called me her dad, I just about collapsed from the incredible joy of hearing those words. I choked up for a second and got misty and had to apologize to the Reynoldses for my momentary silence, saying I got a piece of a snack caught in my throat. Maddie caught it, looking up at me sideways and squeezing my hand. She never again called me Alex, and nothing could have pleased me more. As I shopped for groceries with Maddie one day, I was completely oblivious to the fact that it had been over two years since I dated. As we made our way through the store checking off items on our list, I didn't give the woman a second thought, but Maddie couldn't help but notice that she was looking down at the produce section. Mom, I've never seen a woman so beautiful. 
According to Maddie, you ought to propose a date to her. She made this remark as I was perusing the aisles of the grocery store. So I halted the cart and admired the stunning woman we had just passed. At that moment, she glanced up at me and we exchanged embarrassed smiles. Listen, Dad, aren't you going to tell her something? Maddie glanced at us and questioned. I wanted to just collapse onto the floor at that moment. But I figured the woman might pardon Maddie and me if we tried our luck at college. Hi. Who am I? Alex here. Maddie here. You may have overheard Maddie suggest that I ask you out. But I fumbled the words and couldn't get them out. I would like your opinion. Did you see that million dollar smile on her face? She asked me while staring straight into my eyes. Ooh. Mm. Her caramel colored skin, beautiful white teeth, and smile that could melt ice. And my heart gave her a captivating appearance. She appeared to be around 5'2", 110, maybe 35 years old. Despite her light jacket, she had well-defined curves and her jeans were fitted. I couldn't help but wonder if Maddie had noticed that she didn't have a ring on her left hand. How about we eat supper together sometime? We are all. Or simply the two of us if it suits you better. Mueve suavemente. suavemente. Romeo, Maddie spoke Spanish teasingly. The women said, That was a smooth move, getting your daughter to scope out single women in the grocery for you, and I became a deep shade of crimson due to my flush. Oh no, the truth is that I had nothing to do with this. Definitely not me, to be honest. Indeed, Romeo, it's a deal for me. That is not. However, I would like that. I would love to eat supper with you both. By the way, my name is Cherry Roberts. How serious is this? You thought it was simple, right? I remarked. Damn, I should have been using the kid a long time ago, and we simultaneously laughed. After we exchanged numbers, and I gave her my address, she mentioned that she liked Italian food, so Maddie and I planned to meet up the following Saturday. We fist bumped as we rounded the bend to the aisle, and then we continued shopping. For sure, not required, is it? As we walked, she yelled out our names. Finally, the following Saturday arrived. The days had moved at a snail's pace. After we cleaned the apartment, Maddie and I got to work making homemade lasagna, garlic breadsticks, salad, and tortoni for dessert. The cooking helped me relax, because to be honest, I was really anxious. After all, it had been over 20 years since my last date. I was taken aback when I realized that it had been 20 years since my last date, all of which had been with Tracy. I struggled to recall my previous romantic partners, but I think it might have been Marianne Rizzo. The last I heard of her, she married the man who dated her after me. I wondered if they were still married or if her marriage had taken a similar trajectory to mine. At last I had it together. Listen, dude, this is just a date, a damn date, and you're already thinking marriage. Not only did I feel energized, but Maddie was too. As we cleaned and cooked together, she was right there with me, and I didn't even realize it until Cherry arrived that she would be the first visitor to the apartment who wasn't Mrs. Olivares, or who was older than 10 years old, it was nerve-wracking at first. But having an eight-year-old around is a terrific icebreaker, so I think dinner went well. Similarly, my mom never tied the knot. Cherie, have you ever been in a marriage? She said it all when I offered Cherry a glass of Galliano shortly after she arrived, I said. In response to Maddie's question, Cherry flushed almost as much as I did. She then looked her in the eyes and spoke softly. I was married to a fantastic man, baby. However, that wasn't today. In response to the inquiry, I witnessed a wave of anguish and despair spread across her face. Dad was married for a while as well. In addition to myself, he has two other children, Maddie elaborated. I thought it was time to fill Cherry in on the details of my marriage, divorce, and how I became Maddie's dad. 
She listened intently, her expression remaining expressionless, and both she and Maddie shed a few tears when I told her about Maddie's mother not coming home. However, Maddie's melancholy swiftly subsided as she proceeded to inquire about Cherry's name. Cherry, that's a great name. When you were little, I think your parents were a lot of fun. My given name is Marcella, but I was known as Sella. Well, that's kind of a funny story, baby, Cherry said. Actually, my real name is Marcella. After my younger brother started calling me Cherry, after seeing a box of Sella chocolate, covered cherries at the grocery store. The name stuck, and now everyone calls me Cherry. Well, it fits you much better than Marcella, I entered. I see thick, dark-rimmed glasses, man hands, and a sturdy backside. I see. You will never, ever be allowed to address me by my given name, Cherry said with a grin. That's cruel. I hoped Cherry wasn't being polite when she suggested we should do it at her place next time, and that she had a good time. She stayed with us until Maddie's bedtime at nine, and then she decided it was time for her to go too. As she walked out the door, she kissed me on the lips. For an instant, I felt as though I could smell desire, but it had been so long, I wondered if I was dreaming. My father, I like her. I believe she would be a wonderful addition to our team, Maddie remarked as I swung the door closed. At least I had to concede that the child was correct. For the time being, we did the family date night thing for five Saturdays in a row, and I think we all had fun. I knew, though, that I needed to give this one. I informed Maddie that I was taking Cherry out to dinner, just the two of us, and that she was going to spend the evening with Mrs. Ed. Olivares. I certainly wasn't going to leave Maddie home alone like her mother did. I would never criticize Maddie's mom to her, but leaving an eight-year-old home alone while I went on a date wasn't going to happen. Besides, I think we were both very much aware that things didn't turn out well the last time she was left alone at home. Our first alone date, as Maddie put it, was scheduled to take place at a nice steakhouse. I could tell the vibe was going to be different when I arrived at Cherry's house to collect her. She was dressed in a figure, hugging silk dress, with the back open to show off her perky 36 and the length just right to elongate her already short legs. She was slightly more heavily makeup than usual, and she was sporting a new perfume, something a little sexier and spicier, but not too overpowering. Damn, and I forgot to bring my stick. How the hell am I going to fight off all the other men? If you think that silver tongue is going to get you anywhere, well, you might just be right. I responded with a chuckle. It was strange without having Maddie around, but we still had a wonderful dinner and some nice adult talk without her. Cherry stared straight into my eyes and asked, Are you missing her at the moment? Somewhat unexpectedly. Well, almost, I confessed. With the exception of school and work, we are always together, and I don't mind one bit. You really miss the first two, don't you? Inquired she, terribly, although not with the attitude that I've gotten since I left. I know they're just kids, but they aren't even making an effort to see things from my standpoint. My ex has really poisoned them against me. From what I could tell, you have the makings of an excellent teacher. If you don't mind my asking, how come you never had any? No, I don't mind. We were considering it at the time I made the absolute stupidest decision I ever made in my life. I disrespected and cheated on my husband, all for the thrill of illicit sex. I was a stupid, dumb bitch and tore the heart out of the one person who I cared most about in all the world. It's a mistake I won't ever make again if I get another chance to ever love somebody like that again. As Cherry finished speaking, her voice faded, but I managed to pick up on every word she whispered. She blinked vainly in an attempt to dry her eyes, but they remained watery. After I offered her my napkin, she delicately wiped her eyes. I'm sorry. If I made you go someplace you'd rather not, I informed you. I've never really vocalized it with anyone before this, stated the woman. Not even my parents. I'm too ashamed of myself. 
That's enough grown-up talk then, I replied. Let's see if you know how to move on the dance floor, Missy. Missy? Just how old do you think I am? Twelve? Actually, I figured you for thirty-five, but I'm forty-four, so you're a kid to me, I informed you. She seemed pleased as she asked, Really? Thirty-five? I'm forty-two. I was married for twelve years, been divorced for nine. You are really great for a girl's ego, sir. No way you're just two years younger than me. I look like I could practically be. Your older brother, chuckled I. After I settled the bill, Tracy and I went to a nightclub where we used to go on occasion. Taking dancing classes was one of the first things I did with the additional cash we received since. Although I'm no Fred Astaire, Tracy liked going out dancing. Sitting on the sidelines and seeing your wife dance with other men was not fun, as I discovered the hard way. Cherry had a deft touch and a charming appearance. About half an hour passed as we danced to tempos, ranging from slow to fast. And then I realized I needed a break. Cherry appeared to be able to continue, but she got up from the floor and joined me in claiming a stand-up table. As soon as I got up from the table and headed to the bar, the first vulture swooped down. In an effort not to be noticed, I kept an eye on things from the periphery. I noticed Cherry grinning and laughing. The vulture must have been entertaining, but she remained seated at the table. I felt a pang of pleasure. Upon receiving her margarita, she proceeded to suck on it. Vulture? No. Two. A man of around 25 years old swooped in shortly after. Despite my presence, he continued to turn to Cherry and inquire if she would like to dance. Excuse me, Slick, but the lady is with me. I don't take kindly to being disrespected, especially by children. My voice was soft yet forceful, and I smiled the whole time. Still, the child obviously understood he violated male convention, and I can assure you that the grin wasn't there in my eyes. Apologies. But I was unaware that you two were involved, he complained before slinking away. After we completed our drinks, we returned to the dance floor and stayed there for approximately half an hour longer. At least that other child was clever enough to ask me before trying to cut in once. His response to my rejection was admiral. Can't blame a guy for trying. She's gorgeous. Returning to the table, we each sipped from our second glass. Suddenly, another vulture dove in and begged me to let it dance with Cherry as we were wrapping up. Even though I was exhausted, I decided to let her go out dancing if she insisted. I broke the terrible news to him when she shook her head in my direction. She invited me to come in for a bit after I took her home. At 10, 30, I consented. We continued our easy conversation for another hour, each of us with a glass of wine. At that moment, I stood up and she followed suit. She gave me the adorable chuckle that I was starting to adore so I guess I must have looked like the proverbial deer in headlights when I wasn't sure how to seal the deal. I was in serious trouble when I blushed so badly, and she could tell. Alex, don't be worried. We're not in a hurry, are we? She whispered slightly to me. Two weeks after that, in my bedroom, I put an end to my two-year losing streak. I can't describe to you how wonderful it felt to be relieved by a real live woman and not my left arm. But it wasn't something wild and crazy because Maddie was sound asleep in the next room. I didn't get very far, but Cherry seemed to be pretty experienced at it. I spent a long time nibbling on her wonderful body with pleasure. While she was getting dressed over the next few days, she would be able to look at the prints of my mouth that I had left for her to adore. Although it wasn't part of the original plan, Cherry also slept in my bed with me cuddled up to me for most of the night. She rummaged through my closet for a white dress shirt before we both got up for breakfast. It concealed her undergarments, but still gave her a really alluring appearance. We made our way to the kitchen, where Maddie quickly joined us. Upon seeing Cherry, she let out a cry of delight. Cherry was almost knocked down as she sprinted over and leaped into her arms. Their embrace was tight and it was clear that being held by the other brought them great joy. 
It was so incredibly gooey that I couldn't help but roll my eyes at the couple. They shouted out, Pancakes! Pancakes! Simultaneously, chocolate chip pancakes. I shouted in response. After Cherry stayed with us for six months, we were a modern-day Brady Bunch. I was able to make a respectable livelihood while still paying alimony and child support, and Cherry was able to do the same while working for an accounting business. Despite her lack of specific requests, Maddie had plenty of everything she needed. Perhaps it's true that when you're a kid growing up poor, everything seems like a lot. I suppose that is the how things work. I suppose you could say we were a contemporary take on the Brady Bunch, but more accurately, we looked like the odd couple, or rather, the odd trio. Everyone had a unique last name, and our racial backgrounds ranged from black to white to Hispanic. I was able to get some of that taken care of when I put Maddie in for fourth grade that autumn. Maddie Ruiz Rogers is the name I gave her. When I registered her, she was right there with me, and her expression changed the moment she saw my writing. She remained silent until we exited the school, and then she nearly lost her composure. I can be a Rogers like you. Is that so? She exclaimed with a thrill. Not really legally, at least for a few more years, I responded. But according to Rogers' rules, you are eligible to join the club. I used air quotes when I said Rogers' rules, but that didn't stop Maddie at all. Her sudden entrance into my embrace brought a shower of kisses to my face. After 30 seconds of jubilation, Maddie stepped back and gave me a chill expression. Until she spoke up, I was a bit surprised. When does Cherry get to become a Rogers? She said with merriment. You know, that's a real good question. I'm going to have to give that one some serious consideration. I did it. No joke. Actually, I took Maddie to stay with Mrs. Olivares on our first anniversary, so I could see the jeweler I used to buy Tracy gifts after work. I believed I had a good couple of hours to find the proper ring since Cherry stated she was going to be home late and would catch her own supper. I had just finished designing a unique engagement ring for Jean Horowitz and Jolene, his daughters, when I departed from Jean Horowitz Jewelers, just after six o'clock. My favorite pizzeria is in a little shopping area, and I drove over there after placing an order for Maddie, Mrs. Olivares, and myself. As I was getting out of my car, I caught a glimpse of a trendy little restaurant a few doors down, and that was the second time my world came crashing down. Cherry was leading a dashing black man who appeared to be in his forties into the restaurant. Her demeanor was full of life and joy. Immobilized, I gazed after them. Gas, air, etc. Or ponder. After sitting in my car for what seemed like an eternity, I finally felt like I was about to pass out from a lack of oxygen. A long inhalation and exhalation followed. Then, I went to the pizza joint and placed my order because I knew I had to feed Maddie. Drunk on adrenaline, I drove home. Up until Cherry returned home at around 8 o'clock that night, I don't recall much of the event. She swung open the door with a lively demeanor, clearly in high spirits. Hey, hey, you've never gonna guess who I ran into tonight. My brother John snuck into town without telling me, and after I got done working, he took me out to dinner. I figured since you guys were getting pizza, it would be okay for me to grab a meal with him. Upon noticing the expression on my face, she ceased speaking. So, that's the plot you're pursuing? I whispered to myself. As the truth of what I said replayed in her mind, Cherry appeared devastated. You went to Salvatore's for pizza tonight, and you saw me with him, didn't you? And you thought, screaming at me, she said, you son of a bitch. Let me tell you, I was taken aback. Behold, the guilt I had anticipated, and remorse, not a threat. My first reaction was that there had to be a more modern method to express regret. Although Cherry had never cursed at me before, I could see that she could have a valid point. You are so untrustworthy that you refuse to even give me a chance. 
My infidelity is the direct cause of my husband's departure. I did in fact inform you about it. I was completely forthright. I assured you I would not repeat that error. I get that your ex-wife left you with trust issues, but that's your problem with her. Don't you dare treat me that disrespectfully ever again, or I'll be out of here so fast your head will spin. When Cherry lost it, I watched Maddie steal away to her room, and it seemed like Mrs. Olivares had quietly gone. I kept hoping that the couch would squish me whole, but alas, it did not. You're right, I whispered. I let the mistrust that Tracy planted in my head spill over to you. You are your own separate entity. And if I can't see that, then that's on me and I don't deserve you. I didn't want to tell her about the ring just yet, but I had to play my best card after making such a huge mistake. Her expression was chilling. I don't think I could continue to walk this earth if appearances could kill. So, I know this is probably the wrong time for this, but I need to show you how much I truly treasure you. Give me your left hand. With a deliberate pace, she approached me and extended her hand, palm facing up. After inverting it, I wrapped some paper over her ring finger and fastened it with a rubber band that I had stashed in my shirt pocket. To put it mildly, she appeared perplexed. She removed the paper from her finger, unfolded it, and began reading, exclaiming, What the? A cry of disgust from her lips as she yelled out, You lousy jerk. Seriously? Next. Cherry delivered the most intense kiss on my lips, more passionate than anything Tracy had ever done, to date. After we finished, she summoned Maddie from her room. She held up the ring's receipt and exclaimed, Look, baby, look to Maddie. I'm gonna be a Rogers, too. The shrieking laughter of two happy girls is at a level that men have trouble hearing. Yet I held on to my hearing while they leaped around the room. Cherry prompted her soon. To be brother-in-law, to meet her by pressing a button on her cell phone after they had parted ways. As Cherry was showing off her ring, Maddie returned Mrs. Olivares, and the apartment was still in the midst of its Christmas morning craziness when Cherry's brother walked up. He was a man who could hold his own against Cherry's stunning good looks. As I beheld him once more, the gratitude I felt for being her brother, rather than a suitor, as I had assumed, was overwhelming. We exchanged handshakes as Cherry introduced us. Then suddenly he leaned forward and embraced me tightly. Shaking hands is for friends. And while I want us to be friends, hugs are for family, man stated he. And they're also to show you that should you hurt her, I'll crush the life out of you. You got that? When he stated that final part, he pressed somewhat harder. I understood the message, even though my breathing wasn't great. Ooh, huh? I responded to him in a theatrical whisper. Cherry briefed him on the events that had preceded my handing her the ring. He gave me an expression of feigned surprise, I believe, before expressing his relief that I was alive. She gave you that laser death stare, didn't she? Asked John. Yeah, she's killed people with that look. Upon seeing that expression, Maddie and Mrs. Olivares both realized they were sufficiently intelligent to exit the room. Then he went to Maddie gave her a good once-over and said, So this is the famous Maddie Rogers. I've always wanted some nieces and nephews. I think you'll do nicely. After a timid smile, Maddie's face brightened like a summer day. So, can I finally call you mom? Cherry inquired of her. In the midst of her breakdown, Cherry chose not to respond. They stood there in a lengthy embrace, each sobbing for their own reasons as she reached out for Maddie. We were required by the state to wait until Maddie turned 16 before we could lawfully adopt her despite Darlene's assistance. She could have applied for emancipation and been free at that point, but neither Cherry nor I were concerned about her leaving us. Maddie, Cherry, and I founded this group years ago, and all the state did was approve of it. All blood ties aren't always biological matters of law. Then, seemingly out of thin air, 
I was pleasantly delighted to hear Haley's voice on the other end of the telephone because I hadn't heard from either of my children in over six years since our last encounter. Instead of checking the caller ID, I simply answered the phone and said, Alex Rogers, exclaiming, Dad, it's me, Haley. She hurriedly made her escape. Please don't hang up. Relax, kiddo. I would never hang up on you or your brother. Is something wrong? No, Dad. Everything is good. Great, really. I'm going to get married next month, and I'd like to invite you to the wedding. To be honest, I was more surprised than anything else. Even though she was set to marry this man in just one month, I was so emotionally distant from my little girl's life that I hadn't met him yet. I had my last conversation with my kids right after Ethan turned 16. For Ethan's birthday, we celebrated by having dinner at his favorite restaurant. Despite my best efforts, neither of the kids was particularly chatty. Ethan finally brought out the dessert we ordered immediately after we placed our order. Dad, I'm 16 now, and the court-ordered visits are over. Haley and I don't have to see you anymore if we don't want to, and we talked it over, and we don't want to see you. You abandoned us to keep your silly pride intact. Well, you can take your pride and shove it up your ass. I must admit, my son was quite the customer. He never raised his voice, even though he avoided looking me in the eyes as we spoke. Haley, meantime, continued switching her gaze between Ethan and me. Finally, after waiting for this day, I let out a sigh. You could tell it was Tracy's creation since her fingerprints were all over it. I'm assuming that you realize what wedding vows are and that your mother not only broke ours, she threw them in my face. But she's apparently convinced you too that I'm the bad guy here, and nothing I say is ever going to change your minds. But to me, breaking our wedding vows is not something I can just overlook, like say, wrecking the family car. This goes right to my soul, and while I knew that my leaving was going to hurt you too, my staying would have been worse because it would have crushed my soul and made me less than the man I am, then we wouldn't have been the same. And you would have come to realize that when you'd matured and lived enough to see things for what they really are, this was your mother's mistake, and she has done a good job of transferring the blame to me. Well, I won't accept the blame if this is what you both want. When Haley called out, Dad, Dad, it snapped me back to the here and now. Don't you want to come? Very much so, Haley, child. You know, I even put money aside for the day when this would happen. I told you. You don't need to worry about the money, Dad. Bob has that taken care of. Bob? I asked gently. Wild guess here. But we're talking about Robert Goldstein, i.e., aren't we? Her voice went from angry to pitying as she began to stutter. You didn't know then, apparently. Mom married Bob about six years ago, after we stopped seeing you, replied the woman. This idiot ruined my marriage, ruined my relationship with my kids, half ruined me financially, and then married my ex-wife. All because of my pride, Haley? Every time my son wants to apologize to me, don't be that way, Dad. I'm not inviting you so you can cause trouble. You won't be giving me away. You won't be sitting up front with the family. I just want you to be there, okay? All right, Haley, on one small condition, that I get to bring my family with me. Your family? Yeah, even a loser like me gets to have a family, Haley. I've got a wonderful wife, and we've got an amazing daughter. You'd like both of them, if you ever get to spend any time around them. Haley was next to become absorbed in her own thoughts. Neither she nor Ethan had ever been informed about Cherry and Maddie by me. I was hoping their mother wouldn't find out, to be honest. Do you have another child? Is she aware of our relationship? She inquired, her tone betraying her almost hypnotic state. I practically begged for Maddie on the street, and now she's 16 years old and adopted. She knows all there is to know about you two, our past, and our present. We've been together for nine years. She's fun and bursting with energy. 
Like clockwork, she experienced a setback as well, and we were each other's rock during a dark patch. As if she were beginning to come to terms with the situation, Haley stated, Well, then I look forward to meeting the rest of the family. As one would expect from the daughter of a reasonably affluent lawyer, the wedding took place on a Saturday night in a fairly nice location. Old Bob certainly didn't scrimp on his stepdaughter, though. I got a kiss blown in my direction when Haley and Mark led the procession out of the church, and the girls and I timed our arrival so that we would sit in the back row during the actual service, which took place in a lovely old church in the city. I did see some old friends and relatives, but that was okay because we didn't have to socialize beforehand. We arrived at the reception with plenty of time to secure a table in the back of the hall, which, to be honest, was probably unfair to Cherry and Maddie. They had a girls' spa day on Friday and then purchased new dresses. Cherry's was a seductive and sophisticated number, while Maddie looked 21 years old when she applied full makeup for the first time. Every father's worst nightmare. Nevertheless, they were understanding of my wishes and didn't grumble when we took our seats after I went to get Cherry and I a glass of wine and a Coke for Maddie. It was inevitable that old acquaintances would start popping by the table to say hi and catch up as soon as they saw me. Then Tracy's parents, Rhonda and William, came over. Rhonda sobbed when she leant in for a kiss. William embraced me more passionately than during our marriage. I introduced Cherry and Maddie. Rhonda and Bill appeared a bit awkward, but I guess that was understandable, given that I had been married to their daughter for 18 years. You would have thought I brought a trophy wife to the party, given the reactions of many of my acquaintances to the news that I was seeing a beautiful black woman and a Hispanic princess, especially from the wives of my former friends. Given that I had no say in the affair and had no financial stake in it, I didn't think it was proper for me to mingle and work the crowd, so to speak. The girls and I stayed mostly at the table as guests came to us. Our friendly hosts, Tracy and Bob, showed there just when we needed them to. Married life exposes you to every facet of a person's character. And I could tell from Tracy's reaction, the first time we met, that she didn't like Cherry. Could Cherry have been too dark? Possibly. Could Cherry have been too gorgeous? Probably. Could Cherry have had a flat stomach, wonderful legs, and looked ten years younger than she actually was? Definitely. Could Cherry, with all her good qualities, have been with the wrong guy? Absolutely. Tracy seemed to reawaken from her daze as I leaned in to welcome her with a kiss on the cheek, completely oblivious to the fact that this was our first face to face encounter in almost a decade, while all her thoughts were consumed by Cherry. My apologies, Alex. I apologized because I was a bit wobbly on these new heels. Excuse me, darling. Come, meet the new family. You're looking fabulous, I lied. I introduced Cherry, Maddie, Tracy, and Bob, shaking Bob's hand as warmly as I could while introducing him as the tool of my success in the end. With the exception of Maddie, most people winced at my description, but my daughter gave me a sneaky look and squeezed my left elbow. Have I mentioned that she is perceptive? I introduced them to the bride and her new husband, and we engaged in brief small conversation for approximately five minutes before Tracy and Bob left and the newlyweds came over. As Tracy and Bob left, Maddie gave me a quick head shake that indicated me she was just as happy to meet them as I was to introduce them. I was taken aback and at a loss for words when my other daughter, the bride, welcomed me with an unexpectedly loving embrace, enveloping me in a long embrace and beginning to cry with my new son-in-law, Cherry and Maddie standing by silently. I'm sorry, Daddy, for everything, she said with a sniffle. I did not truly get your perspective until I reaffirmed my own promises around two hours ago. As I was about to make my vows, the reality of your ordeal when your mother betrayed you and broke her promises hit me like a ton of bricks. This has always baffled me. 
I shared Ethan's accusation that you were too proud to admit fault. Finally, it is clicked. In full, you were completely right to do what you did. And she was so totally wrong to not only do what she did, but to pin the blame on you. How can I ever make up for the pain that Ethan and I have caused you? A football-sized lump had formed in my throat, even though I haven't shed a tear since tearing cartilage in my knee during a football game in 10th school. I was on the verge of doing so as my family watched. How about by first introducing me to this handsome stud you made those vows with and then giving me the honor of a dance, said I. Oh yeah, right, she teased, her voice tinged with embarrassment. You haven't met the man of my dreams. Mark Westinghouse, meet your other father-in-law, Alex Rogers, my real dad. After a sincere handshake, I fulfilled my paternal duty and threatened his life if he ever injured my daughter. As we were all getting to know each other, the band began playing, and I introduced him and Haley to Cherry and Maddie. Daddy? Haley asked, her head cocked toward the dance floor. Under my breath, I muttered, enchanted, as I took her arm. As soon as Haley and I were led to the dance floor, the already loud throng moved into a higher drone, intensifying the buzzing that had begun with her enthusiastic greeting. I had a long way to go before I caught up to Tracy and Bob, but I could feel it happening at that moment. I despised the band's choice of music, what I call kid music, but I was able to dance to it because my goddess wife is a dancer. We remained outside for two songs because Haley couldn't believe her long-lost father was a man of the Renaissance. A large portion of the audience had already congregated around us at this point. As the second song came to a close, Haley embraced me once again. The audience erupted in applause, and Cherry and Maddie, beaming with joy, stood by my side, ready to greet me. We got down on the floor and did our thing while the rest of the group joined in. I took their hands and drew them in. Well, look at you, Mr. Rhythm. Cherry whispered into my ear as she approached. As I swiftly turned to Maddie, I told her, That said, let's wait a few more years on another one. I'm not sure my heart can take all this fun. I then added, Who knew that marrying off a daughter could be so much fun? Spin me, old man, Maddie Mock, smirked in my direction. After another six songs on the floor, my girls and I parted ways. I went to the bar for an ice-cold jack, and then sat down at my table to relax. I failed to notice Tracy come up to the table and take a seat next to me as I watched Cherry and Maddie having a blast on the dance floor. As soon as her hand came across my shoulder, I recognized it as belonging to someone special. This should have been our day, instead of mine and Bob's, Tracy whispered into my ear. You threw 18 good years away. For what? You obviously didn't love me enough. I kept my distance from her at all times. No, because I warned you what would happen if you did it. It's clear that you didn't love or respect me enough to refrain from doing it. On the other hand, you ended up with Bob as a result of the arrangement. And I must say, he's quite the catch. And Maddie and Cherry ended up being my companions. You can't always get what you want. But if you try sometime, you find you get what you need, the Rolling Stones said. You were a jerk then. You're a jerk now. Maybe. But I'm a cheerful nutjob who hasn't let your poor choice affect my sleep at all. I didn't anticipate an apology either. Here I am. I invited Ethan to my apartment after he contacted me out of the blue and said we needed to chat because he re-entered my life after he got serious with a woman a few years ago. It seems that faithfulness is a lot simpler to understand when you have some skin in the game, so to speak. I answered the door to find him holding a bottle of Jack Daniels, Tennessee Honey. He entered the flat, and I escorted him inside. Haley said you really like this stuff, and she figured I needed to bring you a peace offering, he explained. Even though Haley and I had healed, Ethan and I still hadn't spoken much at her wedding, and our relationship was precariously balanced at best. Fast forward two years and we still haven't fully recovered. My engagement to Sasha has prompted me to consider the possibility of a marriage to you and mom. 
For a while now, Haley has been trying to convince me that you, and not Mom, were the one hurt, but it wasn't until Sasha and I had the big talk, during which we discussed our feelings toward infidelity, that I finally understood. My apologies, Dad. I've acted like a total moron. Now I understand. I merely wished I could avoid despising Mom. I never asked you and Haley to pick a side. I simply wanted you to understand why I had to leave. I replied, needed to. Get out. Over the next several hours, we had many conversations, interspersed with the inevitable emptying of the bottle of whiskey. Cherry prepared a delicious dinner for us to enjoy while we caught up, and Ethan ended up dozing off on the living room sofa because Cherry wouldn't let him drive after we had shared the bottle of liquor. At the wedding, Cherry, Maddie, and I were seated at the groom's family table. Alongside us were Mark and Haley, who were pregnant, and our first grandchild, Brent, who was two years old, who sat next to Tracy. If nothing else, that would keep Tracy from feeling left out, because she was now alone after Bob dumped her for a trophy wife about a year ago. I had warned the kids that it wasn't smart for them to act as a go, between for Tracy and me. After all, we were adults. If we wanted to know anything, we could just call each other. The kids kept me informed about Tracy through infrequent news bits. I brought in Maddie, a freshman at Michigan State, so she wouldn't miss her older brother's wedding. She, Ethan, and Haley have become close, to the point that they can fool her into thinking she's my favorite child. Observing the three of them interact is fascinating to me. The claim that parenting is more about nurture than nature seems to be true for us, as Maddie and I share an unbreakable bond that even Cherry has acknowledged. I don't think anyone would want what we went through as a family to happen to anyone else, but suffering has brought us closer than we would have been otherwise. Cherry and I have learned a lot from adversity. We both know that you should never take anything for granted, and we cherish our time together as we navigate our new life as empty nesters. It didn't take Cherry long to figure out that an empty nest means no one is overhearing her in the bedroom, so she's turned it up a notch. Hearing her screams of pleasure almost drives me crazy, and it makes me want to please her even more. Some mornings after a night of playing, we can be a bit stiff and sore when we head into work. After everyone had gotten their wedding day responsibilities attended to at the reception, Cherry and I got down on the dance floor. Maddie joined us, along with one of Ethan's groomsmen, but not before Ethan warned him not to mess with my dad's favorite child, or else he would pay the price. I smiled as he spoke. As I began to make my way back to the table after half a dozen dances, I was prompted to remain out for one more by Maddie's desire to dance with me. It was then that I observed Cherry and Tracy, who were seated within arm's length of each other, were silently ignoring each other. Do you sense the chill of the icy air blowing in from over there? As soon as she was within earshot, Maddie inquired, Good sense. After I returned to my seat at the table, Cherry stood up and joined Maddie on the dance floor. I felt a tap on my shoulder and assumed we were going to continue. If Bob dumps me, won't you be the one to boast about it? Leaning in, Tracy inquired. No circus for me. Not my monkeys, I said. I know this may shock you, but you are very seldom on my mind. Even though I have no ill will toward you, I really don't care what happens in your life. Our 18 wonderful years together were a long time ago. These days, I'd rather not dwell on the past because my new life is going swimmingly and what could have been instead. While we were talking, I turned to face Tracy and saw her fear. She was afraid of spending her retirement years alone, which was something she apparently hadn't thought about before, that I would be unable to resist her threats to ruin my life during the divorce. I felt sorry for her for a second, but then I remembered that she would be the one trying to break my spirit if we had been on the other side of the table. Getting up from the table and joining my girls on the dance floor, I added, You know I was a jerk then, and I still am.